when I was a swimmer at the University of Colorado in the early 70s, we shared the locker room with the cross-country ski team. And I, at that point, I'd been swimming since childhood. And, and as I mentioned, I was on a scholarship to, to swim for the university. But I was fascinated by the whole thing about cross-country skiing. And I got, at that point, all of the skiers, they imported all their skiers from Norway. And so I began to chat with these Norwegian guys. And, and then I started to train with them. I'd go out and run and, you know, train in, 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 around the Bol town of Boulder where I lived. And um, then they suggested I take the, I come skiing with them and they sort of taught me how to ski. And, and I thought, this is so much cooler than looking at a lane line for five hours a day <laughs> um, that I was I, I sort of segued out of swimming and into cross country skiing that way, sort of a back back door into it, into the sport. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpre. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpre's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe bomb today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today was coach to five different Olympians and numerous national champions across country skiing. Um, somewhat surprisingly, and I'm definitely going to dig into this, he was a competitive swimmer at a Division I school, University of Colorado. He's a former pro cross country skier. Uh, racing on the World Cup circuit, as well as spending a couple of years racing as a pro triathlete. Nowadays, um, he does a little bit more with author authorship. Uh, he is a co-author for Training for the New Alpinism with Steve House. He's gone on to sell over 100,000 copies. And the book we want to talk about today is co-author in The Uphill Athlete, a manual for mountain runners and ski mountaineers. And it is definitely a manual for sure. Welcome to the show, Scott Johnston. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for sending me the copy of the book. Um, I always like talking to authors, but I always like getting my hands on a book before I have a chance to talk to you so that then I have some context um, of what you've done and we can dive in a little bit deeper instead of me just saying, tell me about the book. <laughs> sure, sure. I get it. Um, so before we get too deep, so the, I mean, the book obviously is surrounding um, – I'll say alpine type sports, uh, but you've got a background in swimming and then you race professionally as a triathlete for a while. Um, tell me about starting there and then making the switch over to cross country skiing. Sure. Um, well, I, when I was a swimmer at the university of Colorado in the early seventies, we shared the locker room with the cross country ski team. And I, at that point, I'd been swimming since childhood. And, and as I mentioned, I was on a scholarship to, to swim for the university. But I was fascinated by the whole thing about cross-country skiing. And I got, at that point, all of the skiers, they imported all their skiers from Norway. And so I began to chat with these Norwegian guys. And, and then I started to train with them. I'd go out and run and, you know, train in the, in, in, around the Bolt, town of Boulder where I lived. And um, then they suggested I take the, I come skiing with them, and they sort of taught me how to ski. And, and I thought this is so much cooler than looking at a lane line for five hours a day. <laughs> um, that I was I, I sort of segued out of swimming and into cross country skiing that way, sort of a back back door into a, into the sport. Was it a matter of like feeling burnt out in the pool, or just it seems I guess as a Outside looking in, it seems tough to say, well, you're already at a pretty high level. I mean, you're competing at a, a Division One school in a sport. And to, to make a transition out of that sport into something else, it seems almost like you're throwing the baby out with bathwater. But it, what, so was it burnout as a motivation or was it just so much more fun to be skiing? That's a great question. And it was a little of both. So I had spent the 
two previous years um, before going to college at the living at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs and mm -hmm. training as part of for what I guess nowadays we'd call sort of a development group of young swimmers. Mm -hmm. And um, we trained at the Air Force Academy pool, but we lived in the, because there was no, at that time, and I don't know if there is now, there was no pool at the Olympic Training Center. In there the is now, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was pretty rudimentary. It was an old military base that had kind of been converted over. And we, we lived in these really, these dormitories with bunk beds, that sort of thing. And I mean, literally all we did was eat, sleep, and train. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, when I was literally, when I say five hours a day, we were in the pool five hours a day, you know, we typical, we kind of averaged around 20,000 meters a day. Mm -hmm. And so doing that from the age of you know, 16 to 18, um, wore on me. I mean, it made me a very good swimmer, of course, yeah. through my high school career, had a really high, high level career there, which allowed me to go to a school like this school, you know, get a scholarship to go to that college. But when I got back, when I got into college, I didn't, I think I was sort of approaching the burnout phase. We had mm -hmm. so that I went to the Olympic trials in 1972 and I missed making the team. And I think at that point, the time horizon of thinking of you know, waiting another four years was just inconceivable to me. I mean, I thought I didn't I don't maybe it's because you're, I was young and impulsive and had a fairly short time horizon. I just said, I'm you know, I, 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 I felt and this is maybe the wrong way to put it, but I felt like. I can just prostitute myself for a college education. I mean, I mm -hmm. can go through the motions. I don't even have to train that hard and I can still be you know, one of the best guys on the team and uh, just get my education and do my job as a swimmer. But I, my love for swimming was fading pretty fast at that point after the, after the Olympic trials. I know a, you know a lot of collegiate athletes experience burnout because they've worked so hard to get there and then from high school to college, there's you know that that step up in competitiveness. In your case, it happened earlier when you're at the OTC and um, you're know, doing that training, but it, it it's hard to explain. And then you know there's just step ups the whole way up, you know from collegiate to pro and then low level pros on up. Yeah. You know, so like burnout is just, is such a real threat that I don't think people who haven't been through kind of the system in their own sport realize how much it creeps up. That I, I completely agree. And I've actually written extensively. You might notice in the book um, on about overtraining syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that is a big problem for endurance athletes and it's often not really talked very much about, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons I've written articles on our website and in the books. And I, cause I've dealt with quite a few overtrained athletes, myself included when I was competing. And, um, I mean, I, that was the reason I did not make the Olympic team in 1972. I was, I went into the trials overtrained and it was you know, flat. Um, so I think it's a, it, it is quite possible and maybe even more so in endurance sports than speed and power sports to become overtrained because the metabolic load is so high on the body because you know, you're know you training five hours a day and uh, yeah. it really takes and at a fairly high intensity. So it can really drain you. When you talk about it in the book, and, and I've seen this mentioned um, other places as well about when you're thinking about overtraining and then getting competition, it's better to be slightly undertrained than it is to be overtrained at all. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I try to err. I mean, one of the lessons I have learned over many, many years now of coaching is much rather send an athlete into competition undertrained than overtrained because when you're undertrained, most of these athletes that you, you know, in your audience and that I've dealt with, they're already type A overachievers. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to give them a kick in the pants to get them to do the work. What you need, what they really need a coach for is somebody to restrain them from doing too much and damaging themselves. And what I find is if you take somebody who's fit and fresh and you put them in competition, they're going to be able to go to that well and dig really deep and get that last you know, 2% out of it. But if you send somebody in there and the well is dry, then no amount of, no amount of willpower will help that person. So mm -hmm. I've kind of adhered to that philosophy for you know, my, you know, once I learned my own lesson with it um, and tried to avoid it dramatically. I, I feel like that's the, the toughest part in, 
it, you know, I, I know I've been through it, um, having been overtrained and, um, it ruined, I'll say, I'll say ruined. It, it's a little melodramatic, but uh, I, like my best year in college and my junior year in, in track season, all the way from the very first meet of indoor up until the conference championship in outdoor, I had a PR in every single event every week, just, mm. cr- just crushing it. And, and something, most times it was like, okay, here's a second to here or there, but it was still just progressively faster. And then by the time conference rolled around, I was just tanked and yeah. I went from running like, like 1550, for my 5k to like 1640. Cause I just had, mm. I had nothing. I had nothing in the yeah. legs to give. Right. Exactly. And, and so it's like, you know, and it's not like I was coached by inexperienced athletes. My coach is a division one runner and you know, he had been mm. through that kind of stuff. So it's like watching it in your own athletes, experiencing it, trying to learn from other people and avoid it. It, it almost seems like many of us, uh, myself certainly included, are just not smart enough to avoid it without having gone through it ourselves. <laughs> well, and, and even if you've gone through it, uh, um, it, it's 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 a very difficult thing for people to wrap their heads around because like, if, if you when you were at your worst overtrained state, if you'd gone to a, a, a medical doctor and said something's wrong with me, he'd have looked at you and thought you are a peak physical specimen. What do you mm-hmm. mean something's wrong with you? Right. I mean, you, I mean, you're better off than 99 percent of the patients that come to see that guy. So when you know you can't get medical help usually for overtraining because they don't understand it, and you're already health look you know you appear very very healthy. Um, And I think that what, so what happens is people end up because of this sort of type A personality type that we deal with in in most endurance sports where, Mm -hmm. where in general, more is better um, until the wheels come off, it's better. And what happens with those type A people is they're very reluctant to accept the fact that the wheels have started to come off. Mm -hmm. And so they, when they will see like the, for me, when you said you had started setting PRs, like that's the first, that's the biggest red flag for overtraining. It's like right. when somebody starts just nailing their best performance over and over again. The what I've seen or what I've done with athletes when that happens is we take a break, we cut, we we go back to some base training, we we lower the intensity, we lower the volume because I, you're you're at such a high level of fitness in that you're probably in a whole new realm of fitness when you were setting all those PRs. Right, and it was an extended your body period is not really, time. Yeah, at, exactly, but, in your, but your body's not really adapted to, that's not your normal level, that's a peak level. Right. And you can't hold that peak for very long. And it might be that, you know, a, through a course of training over in the next couple of years, you could have those PRs could become kind of your standard paces. They wouldn't necessarily be right. PRs anymore. Right. But at that time, they represented a whole new peak in fitness for you. Yeah. And the coach can then say, okay, he's, you know, Jesse's looking too sharp right now. I, I mean, I've had to do this with cross-country skiers leading into the Olympics and say, no, we're, we're going back to some base training for two weeks. You're, you know, they're getting too fit. We're mm-hmm. too far away from the, from the Olympics right now. And so I've um, then that's kind of been my one of my strategies for dealing with that thing. I was I was at a, a coaching conference about five or six years ago. And um, one of the presenters, this was actually around 2000. Mo, um, it was with Alberto Salazar, um, Mo Farah and Galen Rupp were, mm-hmm. as of course, as you know, two of his athletes. And I think it was right after the Beijing Olympics, maybe. So what is that's now quite a long time ago. Um, and he was saying that he never wants to see his athletes PR during a taper. He says that if they're, if they're starting to PR, that means they're getting too sharp too quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's, you know, it sounds like it's sort of what happened with you um, when you weren't tapering, perhaps, because you were, right. you were in the midst of competition. And that might even be a, a, a worse situation where, you know, the training load is probably still fairly high. You were racing fairly often. And if you can you see that and improve, improving performance, oof, that's definitely a red flag. Um, yep. And the, 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 the thing that I've noticed with tra- athletes that are uh, falling into that overtraining or the kind of falling off the overtraining cliff is as soon as they start to see their performance degrading, whether it's in competition or in training, 
their first instinct is, oh, I'm not as fit as I was. I need to do more something, mm -hmm. more volume, but usually it's more intensity. They think, I just don't feel as sharp as I did you know, two weeks ago. So I, need, I think I need to do an extra interval set this week or something like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, all that does is push them even further over the cliff. Right. And if you keep that up for very long, you can dig yourself into a hole out of which some athletes never recover. I have seen athletes, and I, actually there's a, so an article on our website, I, I think this is a really big problem amongst ultra runners, mm -hmm. and I coach a few of them. I coach a few professional ultra runners, and there's the, you know, the, the, the roadside is littered with overtrained ultra runners um, because there's a sport where more is better you know, quite you know, dramatically. And when uh, some of those people, they never run competitively again once they become overtrained because it's taken such a toll on them. So I'm, I really am cautious about overtraining. I think it's a subject that you know, needs more discussion and needs more, more coaches need to be. I've, I've met an awful lot of coaches who had no clue of what overtraining was. They just yeah, said, oh, I mean, you, you just, go ahead, excuse me. No, you're all right. Um, yeah, I mean, looking back at, at that season, it's like, you know, as an athlete, doing it, it's like, well, this is awesome. You know, I love PRing every week. I'm, I'm, clearly, I'm getting better. Um, but the, you know, as you're looking back, the things I take issue with is probably we were competing every weekend, which is too much for endurance athletes, even though like our, our down weeks, I wouldn't run the 5k every weekend. It would be, mm -hmm. maybe I run the 5k one week and I run like the 800 in the mile the next week or something, mm -hmm. but it's still every single weekend plus training during the week, you know, it's just a very high level of um, stress and very little recovery time. Yeah. Um, plus, um, talking about a jump in fitness, you're very correct there. I had, I had dropped over a minute on my 5k time from the previous year to there. Yeah. Um, which I'm not even quite sure how I did it, but mostly willpower, you know, cause that speed, you really shouldn't be able to do that. Um, so yeah, it was all these things kind of coming together that just ended up in kind of a very disastrous, um, conference championship. Uh, and then injuries the next year that basically waylaid me my entire senior year. Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a common story. And, I, you know, yeah. that overtraining is often what leads to that burnout loop that you were talking about yeah. earlier. And when, yeah. when athletes just throw in the towel and say, I've had enough, I can't deal with this anymore. You know, the, the constantly feeling like crap when you're overtrained is, you know, the, and the big, my definition of overtraining, which I didn't invent, but I, I mean, I have a, a 500 page book called overtraining in sport. So that's how serious <laughs> I am about it. Um, and one of the things that the way I define overtraining is that what was once a perfectly tolerable training load is now a completely intolerable training load. Mm -hmm. You know, so something that would have allowed you to recover within, let's say, 24 hours of that workout, now you will never recover. I mean, you can do that workout and you, you don't get any sort of super compensation effect. You don't become fitter from that workout. You just feel worse and more tired. And that's when it can escalate because, I like guess I said before, people will say, oh, I'm just not fit enough. I need to train more. I need to train harder. Right. And that just drives them further down in that hole. So you're saying you... If you see that happening, that kind of like, well, the symptoms of potential overtraining in terms of peaking too soon, um, hitting those PRs, you're saying you mentioned uh, that you take your athletes back down, like we'll do a couple of weeks of base um, to try to prevent that. Do you get pushback from your athletes when you do that? Um, I have a couple of times. Um, and... <laughs> Unfortunately, the athlete, one, one in particular, most recently, you know, a few years ago, prior to the Olympics and cross country skiing, this athlete pushed back, said, no, no, I need to continue this training. We were, we was on, he was on an, a progression of uh, intensity workouts that were, that were building and building, but he wasn't recovering well. And I could see, uh, I, could, I clearly saw that he was overtrained. And I finally talked him into taking two weeks literally off, no training mm -hmm. whatsoever. That's and the then toughest. he, then he wanted to just dive straight back into the same progression at the same place he had left off. Mm. And sure enough, it flattened him out and he was, he was overtrained the entire season. This was leading in the fall, leading into their competition season. And, but 
anybody who, I mean, maybe because I'm kind of beat this overtraining drum a lot, I get a lot of people, you know, writing me emails or setting up phone consultations that are overtrained. And I don't get pushback very often just because I think I'm one of the few people that has dealt with overtraining a lot in, in a lot, quite a few different sports. Um, it, but it is very difficult for the athlete to hear that all this fitness that you have built up in the past is now got to go. Basically, you're going to be lost during the, you know, maybe you end up having to take two or two months off of training uh, if you get really overtrained. And if that's the case, at the end of those two months, you're going to have lost a great deal of fitness. And that is a really scary proposition for a professional athlete or anybody who's really keen on what they're doing. Um, like they just can't believe that that would happen. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it happen. Maybe you recognize this in your own case in one workout where they went from feeling like Superman the day before to never recovering, you know, they're not recovering for you know weeks afterwards, uh, doing one hard workout and had just pushed them right over that edge I was talking about. So uh, anyway, maybe we've talked enough about overtraining. <laughs> it's a deep subject and it's one that I'm really interested in, but I know that yeah. people probably are interested in other stuff too. Um, so one thing we got going and I was going to uh, teach you a little bit when we got started. So first I was going to ask you, where were you uh, like, Eight, eight or eight, ten minutes ago. I have to think about it now. I guess it was back in November. Um, so I had spent a considerable number of years trying to become a pro triathlete. I'm not quite fast enough. Like, you know, my 5K time I mentioned, um, you know, I'm not really fast enough to compete with the big boys, but I, I was trying and nonetheless, just because why not? Um, so I stopped doing that and then I kind of felt myself um, floating about without much of a goal or orientation, mm -hmm. um, training. And, um, my, one of my college coaches grew up in Manitou Springs. And if you're familiar with the area, you probably know where I'm going. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. so I said, okay. And at the time he was like, you have to come out and run the incline. Had never done it. So I said, okay, let's, let's, I told my current coach, I said, let's train for the incline. Um, you know, I'm in Kansas city, so elevation's not very high. And the elevation starts at 6,000 feet at the bottom of the incline, um, and it goes to the top at 8,000. So that's when, when Joe sent me, you know, got me a copy of the book. I was like, Scott, I could have used you like <laughs> eight, eight, 10 months ago to get ready for uh, doing the incline. So if I was going to do the incline again, what, given that I'm in an area that's low elevation and really has no comparable uh, terrain to something so steep, what would you suggest I do to approach that? Well, that's that's kind of an easy question for me, frankly, because so I have Steve and I run a coaching, my co-author of the book, we run a coaching business and we coach hundreds of athletes all over the world for mountain sports. Many of them live in, you know, not in Kansas City, but in places like Kansas City. They mm -hmm. live in big cities without any mountainous terrain around them. And they're faced with that exact same thing. You know, maybe they live in... Uh, Manhattan, and they're training for Everest. I trained a stockbroker to climb Everest, um, in, uh, and he never he did all of his workouts in fire stairs inside of tall buildings. Mm -hmm. He just happened to work in like a sixty-story building or something like that, and and so or whatever. I don't know how tall those buildings are. They look crazy tall to me. I've never been there, but um, so he did all of his workouts there, and it prepared him really well. In fact, he's one of only two people to have ever climbed, excuse me, one of only six people to have ever climbed two 8,000 meter peaks without supplemental oxygen in one season. And I mean, this guy's a stockbroker, so mm -hmm. it can be done. Uh, you have to get a little creative with your training. Um, one thing is in your case, especially, you know, going from sea level to six or 6,000 feet and your performance is going to be heavily impacted. Right. Um, I mean, there's about 25% loss of oxygen at 6,000 feet than there is where you live. So right mm -hmm. away, you know that you're not going to be, um, you know, even if you're very fit, you're going to see a performance degradation by going mm -hmm. to that sort of elevation. And of course, it gets much worse as you go higher. Luckily, those ele that elevation isn't so high that you have to probably worry about uh, any sort of, um, you know, altitude-induced illness, like, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, any sort of um, what we would call... Uh, AMS, acute mountain sickness, is one of mm. is the term for it. Um, but it, it, so I would, I want to take a quick step back 
all the the thing that I find most interesting about you know, people often wonder, well, you coach these con more conventional sports or you've done these more conventional sports. How do they relate to these unconventional mountain sports? Everything from climbing big mountains to, you know, doing 100 mile races through the mountains. And the way they're related is that training for endurance is training for endurance. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're the fundamental principles of you training for your 5K on the track are the exactly the same principles that we would I would use for someone on Everest. Now the but the emphasis is slightly different because you know they speed is not a not a factor on Everest. I mean you, right. there's not enough oxygen you can you can't move very fast. So they don't need the kind of leg power that you needed when you were running, you know, 800,000 1500 meter races. But their your muscles don't know what they're doing. I mean it, you know I've I've tell people you know you might be climbing those final slopes on, on Everest, or you might be running a 10K in the, your local park, and your leg muscles don't know. They don't know any different. And mm -hmm. so what I've done in, in both of our books is taken conventional, well-understood um, endurance sports training methodologies and revamped them slightly to fit these, uh, you know, somewhat unique mountain sports, mm. but there's nothing new. I didn't invent anything new. I didn't do anything new except re kind of repurpose this conventional knowledge and having, you know, been a part of a training group at the Olympic training center and having had a lot of high level coaches and having gotten tested, you know, upside down and sideways for years, I had a, I always had a lot of questions for the physiologists that were doing the tests or the coaches like, well, why are we doing that? Or why don't we do this? Or mm -hmm. what does that test result mean? And so when I finished my real athletic career and I began to get interested in coaching, I actually, I mentioned this earlier when we, when we were off the air, um, I sort of fell into a coaching job because people knew that I had this background in cross country skiing. I moved to a new place. They had a very active junior racing program and they said, Hey, would you coach these kids? And I was enthusiastic about it. I said, sure. And then after I said, sure, I really went, Oh, I don't really know anything about coaching. Um, and so it was, I had, I immediately went out and bought all sorts of books on, you know, first of all, coaching kids and, you know, exercise physiology and just began to kind of cram for this. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a, a 120 kids in the program out of which I produced probably, I don't know, 10, 15 national championships. Um, and it was very successful. And I, and I, but I, during that period, which was lasted about eight years, I was, taking these ideas that I had, some of which were, I learned while I was competing both as a swimmer and as a skier and through my reading and making them applicable to juniors, because what you do with you know, kids under, let's like junior, I mean, under 20 in most sports, um, what you do with those kids through that uh, teenage years, they're, when they're you know, going through puberty, their bodies are developing really fast. How you train those people is quite different than the way you train a mature athlete, somebody you know, 25 and older, let's say. And so I had to figure out how to repurpose some of those ideas. And then I began to work with uh, climbers as well. Because I understood, I having I had a strong climbing background myself. I was doing a lot of alpine climbing at that time, and um, so I knew what was involved in that sport. And I'd say, oh, well, then we can just train this person just like they were, you know, again, going to run that 10k in the in the in the park. Um, and the, and the number one thing that uh, an endurance athlete needs by you know, for any an endurance event is anything that lasts more than two minutes. So that covers an awful lot of territory. I mm -hmm. mean, your your 800 meter, you know, it's kind of that's sort of a borderline event in terms right, of aerobic it. capacity. But certainly by the time you get to the 1500 and above, when you're talking several minutes of effort, then the aerobic capacity is the predominant uh, thing you have to train because yeah. um, almost all the energy um, needed for that event is produced by the aerobic metabolism. So that be, that's why I said that training for endurance is training for endurance. So every endurance athlete needs to be focused on building aerobic capacity. And you know, if they have a high aerobic capacity, then it's pretty easy to get good performance out of somebody with a high aerobic capacity. I mean, there is no such thing 
as having too much aerobic capacity. And it just doesn't happen. You could have too much anaerobic capacity. And mm -hmm. that as an, as an endurance athlete, that will be a problem. Um, and you can be too strong, but you can't have too much aerobic capacity. See, and that's exactly what I wrote, Dale. As you, as you were talking, I was going to ask you, thinking about juniors in particular, um, my thought was, are you focusing predominantly on aerobic development versus like high power output? Yeah, especially for kids. Um, what cross country skiing is a very skill, technical skill dependent sport, somewhat okay. like swimming. It's it's a little more challenging than swimming because you're you know you're vertical, um, you're on a, this gliding surface, and you have to balance on it and still be able to produce power while you're doing that. So the big focus for junior development is on um, skills, okay. so that they they their movement economy gets much better. Um, you know, you can, as you can be, you know, I'm sure you've seen this when you're in your triathlon, you can take someone who's incredibly fit and you throw them in a pool and all they do is make a lot of splash. Yeah. They don't move very fast no. and you take and because there's such a high technical skill component to swimming. Yeah. It's very much like that in cross country skiing. I often see people who are very strong runners or strong cyclists get on skis and all they have a lot of horsepower, but they just can't figure out how to get it to propel them in very fast. And so it's much easier to learn skills when you're young, when your nervous system is really plastic. Mm -hmm. And so kids come along quite quickly, but that's my program always emphasized skills and emphasized. Um, we, we didn't do, when I'm thinking aerobic capacity, I'm thinking basic aerobic capacity, like the aerobic capacity below the aerobic threshold. So very mm -hmm. low intensity. Right. The, these teenagers aren't very well equipped, even though they will respond to it, they're not particularly well equipped for high intensity aerobic, like what I would call aerobic power type work, mm -hmm. you know, zone four, high, you know, high intensity intervals. Right. That's yeah, quick. I was thinking like lots of like zone two, maybe some zone three work, that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, we did a lot of that. And we, and when I also was a big believer, these kids are, I'm trying to hook them on the sport of cross country skiing. And right. skiing is a tough sport because they're, you know, they're doing it in the northern latitudes. It's often in the dark after school. You know, we're out there with headlamps and it's cold and their friends are in the gym playing volleyball and, you know, that sort of thing. And so you got to make these kids have a good time. So we did a lot of games and relays with these young kids, which teaches a lot of skills and it also teaches speed. Um, and I think that age appropriate training, I believe, is really important. And unfortunately, what I've saw in the sport of cross country skiing, which I'm no longer involved in, was that people were saying, oh, well, look at how these World Cup skiers train. We should just take we should do the same thing with these 14 year olds. Well, that's a recipe for disaster because yeah. yet they will respond pretty quickly. But you're often you're forgetting the fact that those 25 year old World Cup skiers have been doing this for 15 years, probably. Right. And they have the aerobic base. They have the, the the general muscular strength and coordination. They have all the skills. So now is the time, you know, in their 20s when you can start piling on high intensity hard work for them. But if you do that to you know, young kids, Often I've seen it happen so much where you know, by the time they should be moving into you know, the adult range, you know, college level or whatever, they're, they're burned out. They're, right. they're fried from it, from right. too much, like, like trying to train like an adult, basically. Yeah, so we come back to burnout and overtraining. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's that case of like, it, it, if it's good for them, it must be good for me. It's like, no, because, you know, in, in going through the book, um, I'm sure you've you probably we talked about Joe Friel. I have a copy of the Triathletes Training Bible that stays on my shelf, not this shelf, but my shelf downstairs. And uh, you know, I've gone through that a number of times. I reference it in various videos I've done. Um, just lost my train of thought. Uh, to totally gone. That's okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Back um, me up. We're talking about juniors. Yep. Um, if, what about? I mean, maybe I'm. Are you going to edit this video when you're done? No, we're just straight. <laughs> okay, through. We just, this goes live. Okay. All right. Um, well, I was thinking of a couple of thoughts I had about you know, you know the junior thing, but I mean maybe we don't have you don't have a lot of audience that's you know interested in in how juniors train um, and and what happens as you go through the the 
the, the develop that very difficult transition period from teenager to adult, right, which corresponds with the university for most people, mm -hmm. for you know athletes often, and the sport of cross country skiing is a collegiate. You know, NCAA sport, and so kids get recruited, and they go to these colleges. And it's I I wrote a uh, a paper that was delivered at a, a ski coach conference, and it didn't make me very popular. But I um, I called it the developmental disconnect: how we are ruining our young skiers. Mm -hmm. We throw them into what was essentially a professional level program, right? You know, when they're still in this critical development stage. Uh, in their late teens, and we throw them into a program that all it cares about is performance next week, you know, right. the, re the, the next beat or this season. And so they they can go from a, a, a nice, long, gradual trajectory approach of, okay, you know, every season they're getting a little stronger, they're learning to ski better, they, you know, all these things are coming together. And then you throw them into this program where, all yes, as a 19, 18 or 19 year old, they're, they're training like some Norwegian national team member. You know, they're training 800 hours a year and they're doing all this intensity. And what until I was the first one to coach a, uh, a former NCAA athlete, cross country skier to a World Cup podium in cross country skiing. Mm -hmm. when it's, and that's kind of a sad commentary on what happens to skiers in college is that because most of the best skiers, I mean, only a handful will make the leap from high school to the World Cup. Right. Very, you know, just a few, three or four. Most of the rest get channeled through the NCAA programs and they come out the other end, just a shadow of what they were when they went in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I felt like we were doing a huge disservice to these kids who are you know, highly motivated. You know, all they want to do is ski race and, and they're focused, they're dedicated. And then they come out of these programs four years later. Uh, and sure, they've got a great education, but they're not, they're not going to be competitive on the World Cup after that. And so I sort of set up a different program for some of the athletes I worked with and um, could keep them on that same trajectory that then allowed them to move on to um, the World Cup. Since this fellow that I um, that was ended up on the World Cup after college, um, since him, we've now had a handful of others that have, but, but a tiny handful. When you think of all the hundreds and hundreds of top cross-country skiers that go into colleges, and the fact that we've only had probably four or five that have ever stood on a podium at a World Cup kind of speaks volumes about the training of that training approach. Yeah, I, mean, I, I got my train of thought back. And you know, all coming together here is like thinking about specificity for a particular athlete uh, and thinking about Joe Friel's book, your book. Um, I think you guys mentioned in the beginning, there's um, no one right way to make a cake. Like you, the book is not a, this is how to train. It's like, these are the things you need to know about training to figure out the thing that you need to do. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then in, so in combination with the juniors and college, it's like coaches take this one size fits all approach and just say, if they're doing it, you're going to do it instead of focusing on, and this is what I talk about with, with Joe's book. He focuses a lot on talking about limiters, the various limiters that we have as endurance mm -hmm. athletes. Mine in particular is power. I'm not very good at producing high amounts of power, but I, I can go forever, but you know, you stick me and do a 400, like I'm just going to get toasted. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing in his book that speaks to, that's my issue. So the same, the kind of workouts that are going to help me progress are not necessarily going to be the same kind of prog workouts where like the other guys that were good at 400s, they may need something different. And, and so then in college, we end up with both a one size fits all idea of everybody's doing the same workout, regardless of what your limiters are. And then on top of that, let's compete way too often and now we come back to overtraining. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think that one of the things of, and, and along those lines, it's missed by an awful lot of people is, you know, the, the popular press, and it used to just be a few, excuse me, a few magazines, and now it's all over the internet is, you know, here's what so-and-so did for, you know, three months leading into breaking the world record. Mm -hmm. With the implication being that, oh, if I go do that same thing, then it's, I may mean, not break the world record, but I'm going to become much, much better. Right. And the fact, you know, that just doesn't work that way because 
it's not what that person did in the last few months leading to their you know, fantastic performance. It's what they've done in the last 10 years mm -hmm. that allowed them to do that last three months. You know, the work capacity of these athletes can, is so phenomenally high that you know, if you look at some of the old workouts from Sebastian Coe, for instance, where you know, he was doing, what is it, like 3200s? You know, a 30 second rest at mm -hmm. 800 meter race pace. <laughs> That's yeah. just phenomenal. I mean, right. who could do that? And everybody would say, well, and, and he claimed, and his father, who wrote up the book about their training uh, together, you know, they thought that was one of the best workouts they did. And it probably was. You can imagine, it's very, very specific to the event they're working on. And, but no, how many people could even begin to do something like that? You know, have right. the work capacity to handle it. So it, it wasn't that that workout, that workout did put him in peak form. You know, that was, he did that workout the year that he went on and broke every uh, record between 800 and, and 3,000 meters in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty phenomenal uh, bunch of results. But it was what he had done for the whole his whole life up to that point that gave mm -hmm. him the capacity not only to handle that kind of a workout, but to to uh, flourish under that sort of extreme uh, regimen. And most people are not going to have that. And I feel like it's a real disservice in the popular media to you know throw out what it, here's what Iliad Kipchoge did for you know um, you know the last four or five months of his training before he broke two hours in the marathon. Well, that's, it's wonderful to read and it's very inspiring, but it's also incredibly dangerous in the hands of, if you put that in the hands of a type A personality who just wants to do more, mm -hmm. but who doesn't understand much about training, then you're just, you know, I feel it's kind of irresponsible of journalists to, to toss that stuff out there as it's the same. I put it in the same category as those kind of, you know, the men's magazines and whatnot to so run your best 10 K in six weeks. You know, that kind of, well, yeah. Maybe if you've never run a 10 K that might happen, but yeah. if it was that easy or it took that little time, why would these athletes be training a thousand hours a year for 10 years? I mean, if you could do it in six weeks, why would you do all that? Yeah. And, and it's, I feel like in the media cycle, there's almost, um, a necessity to produce articles like that. I mean, I have, you know, I have a, a, another show on the YouTube channel that I talk about running and my experience with running and, and, you know, I mentioned um, thoughts on coaching and workouts and those kind of things. And often I end up, you know, titling things like, you know, the number one secret to their fastest 5k or whatever. And mm -hmm. I go on throughout the video and say, well, this is one thing you can look at, but also, yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it depends yeah. on where you are. Um, so it almost always comes with caveats because you, you know, so as a, as a, I'll say a media personality, I'm overblowing my, my importance here, but just, you want to give, you know, tidbits of advice, but it's almost impossible unless it's me and you sitting here and you know, my history, or I know your history and right. I can give you specific advice. It's almost impossible to do that. So you end up with these potentially dangerous in the wrong hands prescriptions of, of workouts just to sell papers or get, eye, you know, gain eyeballs or whatever it is. Sure. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the approaches I've taken with both of these books, training for the new alpinism and training for the uphill athlete, is the reason I call them a manual is they are an instruction manual on how to create successful training programs for yourself. Mm. They are not a cookbook. Um, and I, I find that happening. You've, I'm sure you've seen them. There are many cookbook type yeah. training books out there where you just, you, you know, you open it up and you skim through the page to the, okay, I want to run a, you know, 15 K cross country race or whatever it is. And here's how to train for it. Honey, here's all the workouts I need to do. Well, that would be great if everybody was exactly the same as everyone else. And, mm -hmm. um, but we're not, we're, we're coming into this with all sorts of you know, different backgrounds. Some people have extensive training histories in their youth, like you did, or I did, and we're going to adapt differently to training than somebody you know, who's 45 years old and has never run a step in their life. Right. It's going to be very, very different types of training. And so what I've tried to do in these, in both these books is start with what I would call some very fundamental principles. I mean, there's, there's, a, as you saw, there's a physiology section in that book. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple, you know, anybody who's had high school biology, I think would be able to follow along and see where it's going and how it works. Because I feel like you need to understand why you need to train the way 
we're going to talk about in that book. And here's the physiological basis for that. And then I get into very heavily, as you probably saw, a lot of ways of trying to help the, the reader or that, that the self-coached athlete, not first of all, identify their, their limiters, like mm -hmm. you're talking about Joe right. Friel doing. I think that's very important, you know, and for, for people who are at a fairly low level, they're the beginners, like my junior cross country skiers, everything's a limiter. And right. for them, almost anything they do is going to make them better. As you get better and better, like what I've been, you know, working with an Olympian, it's very hard to figure out what is keeping this person from going faster. Mm -hmm. It becomes a real challenge. It's, um, for me, it's intellectually really fun because I have to try to suss out by watching the athlete and paying attention to their training and their racing. I have to watch them in races and say, oh, okay, here's, a, here's a potentially some low-hanging fruit. Maybe we should address that and try this with our training. But in general, you know, that's, the first thing is to identify those limiters. Then the next thing is to be able to um, focus on these fundamental qualities that make up your event and train those fundamental qualities. Um, so you need to look at the event and say, oh, this, you know, this event requires this kind of speed, this kind of power of endurance and and you know then you can you can train we train in my approach we train those in different workouts it's in the base phase we don't bring you know a speed and endurance workout together until the final phase sort of like mm -hmm. that that workout i just mentioned with with um sebastian co where that that workout was speed and endurance yeah. piled you know all combined into one workout but he had spent years doing speed work and basic endurance work too before mm -hmm. they you know they started to bring that together and every you know every training cycle there will be a period when you do need to bring the the speed and what we call speed endurance workouts or we bring those we bring those two qualities of speed and endurance together um, because you have to do that for, if you're training for you know an event that involves speed and endurance you just have to have that type of training but it can't dominate your training and that's a mistake that a lot of folks make is they go well if I want to get faster you know at running 5k I should just go run 5k as hard as I can every day right because my training should be as specific as possible. But that overlooks this fundamental quality issue, and it also overlooks that limiter issue we were just talking about. If your mm -hmm. limiter is, let's say, basic aerobic capacity, zone one and two, then going out and doing a 5K time trial every day, all that's going to do is lower your aerobic capacity. It's not going to raise it. It's actually going to damage your aerobic system to do that kind of training. And so it's a little counterintuitive that sometimes you have to tell people they got to train easier and slower to go if they want to go faster. And, you know, most people just want to jump, you know, it's a Maybe it's a product of, you know, our impatience or whatnot, but most people just want to go right to the, the good stuff, the sexy stuff, you know, the YouTube yeah. video stuff, that kind of thing. Yeah. They don't want to go out there and spend, you know, thousands of hours um, a year training at, in zone one and two, and, or not thousands, but hundreds of hours a year training in zone one or two. Um, because that's kind of boring training, actually. It doesn't and it doesn't look very much like their event, so they have a hard time understanding, well, if this doesn't look like my event, how is it actually helping me? Yeah. And so I spent a lot of time in the book talking about that so that people will understand why that base training is so important. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the other thing that differs, slight difference, I think, between this book and, and many others is I then try to teach people how to monitor their own training and control mm -hmm. it. Because that's the job of a coach. And most people are going to be self-coached. And so I give some ideas on you know, you know, what can you do? Because you're the worst judge of, you know, as, as you probably already know, anybody who self-coached the, themselves is, realizes that they're the worst judge of how to coach themselves. Because yeah. you've got all sorts of emotional baggage you're bringing into this. There's the ego. There's the, well, my plan says I'm supposed to go do, you know, five by one mile at this pace or something this today. But I'm, my legs are really shot. But I, boy, if I don't do that, I'm going to feel guilty. I mean, there's all that kind of stuff. And what a coach does is it, they bring this voice of reason in and say, you know, you're not ready for that workout today. We should do a recovery, you know, half hour recovery jog or a spin on the bike today instead and get you back to where you can absorb that sort of training. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a real struggle, even when you even for a coach. But it's all it's very difficult for the self-coached athlete. So I've tried to give people some help on what to be looking for. How long these things should take to recover from? What should you feel like? How can you test 
your preparedness to begin training again and that sort of stuff. So some real tools, but again, it's more of a, a, a manual on like, if you read this and you understand these principles, you have a pretty good chance of being able to construct a, a very viable plan for yourself. Um, but it's not going to be easy. I, you know, people who buy this book often say, Oh my God, it's like a textbook. And yeah, you can have to roll oh, up yeah. your sleeves. You're gonna have to roll up your sleeves and, and really want to study this stuff. It's not a quick yeah. read. Yeah. And that, the, the whole idea of self-coaching is so difficult, as you mentioned, the kind of emotional baggage. In, in, so having those, I'll say those tests or indicators to say, okay, we need to back off or okay, we're fine, is so crucial when you don't have an outside voice. Because and I've talked about this with, with other guests, and you've, I'm sure, experienced this, is that not always do how you feel when you wake up in the morning have a bearing on how a workout goes. Sometimes you feel crummy and then yeah. your workout goes great or you feel great and your workout goes terribly. So yeah. having those external indicators that can say, hey, this is going on, maybe we should back off and not feeling guilty about it is yeah. is like that. I mean, that's worth the book in itself. Just, <laughs> just having that um, it will save you so much time, pain, headache and make you better in the long run. Yeah, I've definitely experienced all that stuff. And I, I think that, you know, being, you know, obviously that's one of a coach, as I mentioned in the very first segment we talked about, one of the coach's most important roles is to restrain the athlete from hurting themselves yeah. and overdoing it. Because these athletes are type A, they are going to, you know, they just, they're going to be tugging at the leash all the time. And it's our job as a coach to make sure that they, they understand or we could take the blame. We can say, hey, right. you're gonna, today we're not doing that. I mean, I have, with these high level, you know, Olympic level athletes, I've been out, you know, standing beside them when they're training and just said, nope, it's not happening. And I can see by your body language. I can see, you know, here, you know, we're checking blood lactates at the end of a warm up, and I can say, well, okay, you know, your, your pace is slow, your lactate is high. You're not prepared for this workout today. And we'll, we'll call it at the end of the warm up. You know, or, par, or even partway through the warm up, I can just see this is not going to be the day that they can go out and and do this you know high performance workout. Mm -hmm. And we'll call it and say, okay, we'll come back in a couple of days and try this again. In the meantime, you're just going to be doing some you know lighter recovery work or uh, that sort of thing. And I I think that having for a lot of people having the coach there that could say to you, uh, no. You're not doing that. It, it, it relieves them of that sense of, of guilt. Or am I just yeah. being a wuss? Am I just being a weenie because I don't want to do this? Right. Um, which is very rare. And I often tell people, again, because of this, the kind of personality type that we're dealing with in these sports, is if you don't, if you have even the slightest inkling that maybe you're not really very psyched to go train that day, you should consider that your body's trying to tell you something there. You know, there's that's a yellow, if not a red flag. Yeah. Something that you know, and because most people are just hungry to get out there and get after it. And if you don't feel like it, then boy, that's that's your body. You know, our body doesn't have a very good way of communicating that mm -hmm. kind of. And we have such a most people have such a strong willpower. Right. Like like you said with your you know the way you improved a minute in the, the 5K was will a lot of willpower. Mm -hmm. And the willpower will take you a long way, but it can also be, you know, your worst enemy. Right. Right. Um, before we run out of time, I want to ask you about the section of the book. Um, and this is crucial to, you know, any endurance athlete is um, fat, adapt fat adaptation, getting our bodies mm -hmm. to burn more fat for fuel. Um, I Please correct me if I misquote you. Uh, I think uh, it's mentioned talking about changing your diet slightly to increase the amount of fat you're taking in to help along that cycle of fat adaptation. Mm -hmm. Is there a limit to that? Could we just in that, if we want to follow that train of thread, could we just cut out carbs entirely and say, all I'm going to eat is fat and protein or, or is there a point where you say, okay, you, like that's not it. You do need carbs, um, for that fat, adapt fat adaptation cycle. Yeah. Well, this whole nutrition thing, as you know, can be a can of worms. But I'll, right. I'll, I'll start off by saying this. that So Zach Bitter holds the U.S. 100-mile record. He's a carnivore. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Scott Durek is one of the grand old men of U.S. ultra running. He's been around right. forever, and, and he's a vegan. So there's two guys at the opposite ends of the food spectrum right. <laughs> that are both highly successful in their, their sport. So what, you, what I think is important to take in, into consideration, we are omnivores, and we can adapt to all kinds of diets. So I don't think it, ne- it needs to be, um, I don't think it's rocket science, first of all. I don't think it needs to be approached with some the, sort of the religious fervor that some people bring into the whole dietary nutrition argument. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a few rules with regards to that whole fat adaptation thing is if you're training enough volume, and I'll get to what enough is in a minute, um, if you're training a high enough volume, you can pretty much eat anything. Yeah, I mean, I work with vegetarians that eat really high carbohydrate diets, and they are super fat adapted, but they're training 20 hours a week. Mm-hmm. And so they're going to be fat adapted because they're kind of chronically glycogen depleted. Mm-hmm. They don't ever really refill their stores during a normal you know, training block of time. Um, you, you know, if, especially if we're in a base period where we're trying to build fitness, you know, I don't care if they're carrying this you know, sort of a low level fatigue with them much of the time and chronic glycogen depletion. Because glycogen depletion is one of the biggest stimuli for aerobic development. You know, if you run out of glycogen, those muscle cells go, whoa, we better create some more mitochondria and some more, you know, aerobic enzymes so that we can produce energy from fat. And so it's a big spur to uh, aerobic development to have this glycogen depletion. And, and so I mentioned the 20 hour mark. But what I have seen now coaching hundreds of athletes for years, uh, working with lots of different people, who, you know, different age groups is that. When people are doing less than about eight hours of aerobic base training, zone one and two work in a week, then there, you can kind of bump start that fat adaptation process by restricting carbohydrates. Once you get over about 12, 14 hours a week, then I think it's much less important, you know, mm-hmm. it, the, the, fat, the, the, the carb restriction. So that's my kind of my rule of thumb. And you know, if you know if you're in that gray area, and of course there's going to be a lot of individuality. But if you're in that gray area, let's say you're training ten hours a week, then the thing you have to do is experiment. You know, mm-hmm. find out how you handle fasted training in the morning. You know, get up in the morning, go out for a two hour run. You know, and if you are bonking at the end of that two hour run, I mean, assuming you're in staying in zone one or two, or you are just absolutely famished and have to eat that cliff bar or goo before you get done, then you're probably not very well fat adapted. A lot of these ath- professional mountain athletes I work with, they can go out and do five hours. You know, hard, you know, with, with several thousand vertical feet running in the mountains and come back and not even be hungry because mm-hmm. they're very highly fat adapted. Um, and as far as the dietary manipulation goes, as I pointed out earlier, I try to keep it pretty simple for, for, for folks. Yes, a ketogenic diet will do that to you. It will mm-hmm. cause you to become fat adapted for sure. Right. Uh, it does work. Um, I've done quite a lot of work with uh, Navy SEALs and some of those guys are really into ketogenic diets, um, but they're also an incredibly highly disciplined group of people. Yeah. And most people are not going to be able to adhere to a real ketogenic diet. And as, and as you probably know, you know, those first that first week to 10 days of going, getting into ketosis is not very much fun. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's an unpleasant experience. And then finally, when you're in ketosis, then, yeah, the, things roll along pretty well. But let's say you then go to, you know, you go to your grandmother's house for Thanksgiving and you have the pumpkin pie and the mashed potatoes and all you've fallen off that ketogenic bandwagon. You have to go through that whole process again of becoming going and going to getting into ketosis, which is so most people are just not for social reasons are probably mm-hmm. not going to be able to actually stick with the ketogenic. You're going to be the that person at the party that people are going to I'm not want to invite that guy because he never he never he won't eat anything <laughs> kind of deal. Right. And uh, so in order to avoid that, I think you can get the same effect. I mean. Ketogenic diets, I think, work well for people that aren't exercising, work better, let's say, for people who are not exercising. Mm-hmm. Um, but for if you're an endurance athlete, you might experiment with it. I have some endurance athletes that I've coached that have tried ketogenic diets. Most of them don't stick to them. Um, but if you, I think you can get 
virtually all, if not all, the same effect if you're training a, a reasonably high volume of, of aerobic base work and do a slight uh, carbohydrate reduction. You know, instead of using the traditional American food pyramid, I tell people just shoot for like, you know, one third, one third, one third with carbs. Yeah, that's that's what we're trying to do now is you know, just something towards really, that. pretty simple. Yeah, it doesn't need to be too crazy. And I'm not I don't advocate, you know, measuring everything. I just think that, again, that going to be a comp level of complication that most people won't be able to adhere to. Mm -hmm. And diet has to be sort of a lifestyle thing, something you do every single day. And if it involves getting out a scale or, you know, m reading the, the ingredients list with a magnifying glass, you know, that, that's not going to last very long for most people. They just won't right. have the, the wherewithal to do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so as we kind of wind down, there's a question I'm asking everybody this year because um, it really kind of transcends what each individual person does. Um, so the question I'm asking everybody is, what do you think the purpose of sport is? I think it is, the, well, can, I think there's more than one purpose. But for, the, for each individual, I believe it is self-actualization. You know, you know, you have, you are the only person really that has agency over yourself in your actions. And, you know, there's many ways you can express that. I mean, you could paint pictures, you could play the piano, or you could do triathlons. But in, in some way, I believe that those, that uh, self-actualization is a, a really uh, nurturing part of the human spirit. And that it's something that we all seek. You know, otherwise, we wouldn't have artists and we wouldn't have athletes. And, and uh, so I think on an, in, on an individual basis, that's really the purpose of it. Um, and competition is a very you know, simple, easy way to, uh, to compare yourself, to see if you, you know, even if it's competition with yourself, which, of course, is the healthiest competition. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you, st when you obviously in the race, you toe the line with other people, you'd like to beat them. But, but if you perform at your best and you have a PR or whatever it is, and you can say, whoa, yeah, I didn't beat so-and-so because that so-and-so had the race of their life today. I, you could have the race of your life that same day, but they still beat you because they were better. Um, and, but that doesn't diminish your own personal experience, or I believe it shouldn't. And this is something I worked a lot with when I was coaching juniors is, you know, don't just directly compare. You know, it's fun to win the race. Everybody likes winning the race, but don't compare yourself that way to other people. Compare yourself to the person you used to be, you know, mm -hmm. what you were a week ago or a year ago. And I think that is helpful too. And I think also the other thing I was going to say that I believe sport does is, in a way, I think we still need heroes in our culture. Mm -hmm. And so when we read about, you know, Iliad Kipchoge, who can't be, you know, just jaw-droppingly impressed. Like, here's a guy who runs, you know, a two hour, th thing that people thought would never happen, two-hour mm -hmm. marathon, under two-hour marathon. I mean, and you look at what that guy's done for training, and, you know, and he seems like, a, and from everything I've read and seen, seems like a wonderful human being. Mm. How can you not be impressed by that and not think, wow, what a cool thing. And so yeah. I guess that's, you know, for me, that's the other part of what sport does is it motivates us and inspires us. That's, uh, I haven't got the hero answer yet. I like that a lot. Um, Scott, where can people find you? Where can they pick up the book? Um, if they want to pick it up, want to get in touch with you. Yeah. Okay. So um, our website is uphillathlete.com. So pretty easy. Um, the book's available on Amazon. It's also available as a signed edition on our website, but it's much cheaper on Amazon. I have to say that. <laughs> I, I have to, I pay almost what Amazon does for our books. Uh, books are published, both, both our books are published by Patagonia Press. Um, so yeah, they can find us there. And there's a wealth of information on the website. There's over 250 free articles on training and um, there's a forum that people can ask questions on. So yeah, all that's available for free. And as we've mentioned multiple times, it is a manual, not just a, this is what you do. So even if like in my case, I'm not really an uphill athlete, um, aside from the occasional venture to, to Manitou Springs, um, there's so much here like that that's applicable regardless of what you're doing. So 
well worth picking up if you can. Uh, thanks for spending time with me today, Scott. I really appreciate it, Jesse. It was great chatting with you. Thanks.